giving you a lecture on physiological challenges. Um, I believe you're all second years, so hopefully this is, um, or at least this is aimed at you. Um, I would like to make this an interactive session, so we are going to be using Socrative and I'll give you details of that in a moment. Um, and if you do have any questions, um, please do unmute yourself because I'm sharing my whole desktop. I won't be able to see the chat very well. Um, so just shout. Um, I don't mind you interrupting me if you need to. Right. So Socrative, um, if you've not used it before, you can just search Socrative student login and the room name is DJ OSME. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. If anyone has trouble logging on, let me know. I'll leave that up for a bit. I'm just gonna check if people are getting into the room okay. Okay, we've got seven at the moment and people are answering. So yeah, my first question is just to see, to gauge how you guys are going, um, how confident you feel. Um, I'll just flick back in case anyone else wants to log on and give you another 30 seconds or so. Fine, so um, let's see how everyone's feeling. Okay, not too confident, that's fine. Um, if you have specific questions and I don't answer them as I go, I will have a lot of time to ask questions, so please do. Um, fine, okay, so next question um, again is a little um, one to check where you guys would like to focus. So these are the kind of um, topics we're going to be covering today. Um, all are physiological challenges, but some are a bit longer, more complicated. So I just want to see what you guys really want to focus on and we can spend a bit more time on those. Okay. Okay, so exercise physiology, body temperature control, fine. Not many people on life at high altitude, which um, I'm impressed by. If you guys uh, get it, that's brilliant. Um, so, OK, we'll focus on those two um, as we go. Fine. So um, this is the syllabus. I'm not going to ask people to look through it, but it's just there to kind of demonstrate the points and how much needs covering. Um, so we'll just start with changes in posture. So we're basically looking at the orthostatic challenge. Um, could so my next question on Socrative, could you tell me what the orthostatic challenge is? Um, just a couple words on what you think, what you understand by that term. Okay, I'll show the answers. So when you stand up, BP drops, yeah. Maintaining venous return, yeah. Stand up, pulse, yeah, brilliant. Yeah, so you, I'm glad you guys all know what it is. Um, so as you have all well pointed, um, you're basically, as you stand up or go from a vertical to upright position, um, sorry, horizontal to upright position, um, you're going to get blood pooling in different places. Um, so the distribution of blood is changing. So in this situation, the challenge we're thinking about is blood pressure. 
Um, whenever you think about blood pressure in physiology, always think about the two equations. Um, so blood pressure is equivalent to cardiac output times total peripheral resistance, and cardiac output is equivalent to straight volume times heart rate. Um, hopefully you have all come across those, but if not, they are there. Okay, um, so how does the body detect this change in um, blood pressure or in um, blood distribution? I don't think I have a question on this. Oh, I do. Okay, answer in Socrative, please. <laughs> I'm just going to aim for about six or seven people, yeah, barrier receptors um, to answer just in interest of time. So yeah, barrier receptors, that's what we're looking at. Um, so I think it would be a good idea to cover the barrier receptor reflex. Um, and this is basically what we're looking at. So um, it's a negative feedback loop. Um, you'll get an increase or change in your blood pressure. And um, the Barrel receptors in your aortic arch and carotids detect that the change, and you'll get um, afferent signals going to the cardiac control centre in your medulla oblongata in the brain, um, and in turn this will cause upregulation of your sympathetic nervous system, downregulation of your parasympathetic nervous system. And that causes increase in cardiac output and stroke volume. And from our equation from before, we know that that will um, increase your blood pressure. And then you've normalised your blood pressure to a normal value for you, and you're no longer in a challenged state. Um, so you've all come across that. If there's any questions, do let me know. Um, extension syllabus wise, so I, I think that that pretty much covers, it's quite a simple area. Um, extension wise, we're thinking about what nerves we are um, using. So the afferents going from the baroreceptors are the carotid sinus nerve, glossopharyngeal nerve, and from the aortic arch, the vagus nerve. Um, and the efferents are your sympathetic nerves on, and your parasympathetic system is via the vagus. Um, so there are plenty of really nice diagrams um, out there that you can use to just model off of. But I do think that it's a good idea to draw your own if you can, including these. And don't worry about making notes. Um, like Rosie said earlier, um, you guys will be getting handouts if you fill out the feedback. So um, if someone wants to shout out, um, can you tell me a bit about peripheral neuro neuropathy, why the syllabus says EG in diabetes um, and why you think that that might affect the orthostatic challenge or your response to it? No volunteers? So diabetes um, is characterized by high levels of glucose, right? That's how it's diagnosed, um, and that is the pathology. So the high levels of glucose can cause glycosylation of proteins in many different places. So you don't just get neuropathy, you get nephropathy, so kidney damage, a retinopathy, so eye damage, also this neuropathy, so nerve damage, um, as a result of diabetes, which is a systemic disease. So damage in your um, nervous system, what, why, do you, why do you think that that might, in your peripheral nervous system, why do you think that might cause an orthostatic intolerance? Again, shout out if anyone 
is willing. I don't want to spend too long on this because it's a Okay, fine. Um, I'll stop asking people to shout out because it doesn't seem like the group is too keen on that. So that's fine. Um, so if your um, nervous system isn't working as well, you might have some disruption um, in your detection systems. And that's basically all I was trying to get at. Um, and because diabetes is a systemic disease, it will affect everywhere basically. Um, Antihypertensives um, are obviously in place to lower blood pressure so those include like beta blockers or um, can't think of the others of um, diuretics. Um, they have different um, mechanisms but they all aim to lower blood pressure part of the name um, and if you're lowering your blood pressure you can get a bigger drop in blood pressure from lying to standing and that's what causes the orthostatic intolerance isn't it um it is that change so the drop in blood pressure is what you're looking at um venocaval compression supine pregnant women it's kind of self-explanatory um but you're going to get so having a extra space occupying thing in your body, um, i.e. the fetus, um, can put pressure on in your um, abdom abdominal space, right? So um, you guys might have come across this with neuro things. Um, if you get a space occupying lesion in neuro, then the pressure has to go somewhere, right? And that's when you get um, the brainstem um, herniation or um, you can get other types of herniation but um, the concepts are very similar you're getting an increased um, pressure in the abdominal cavity and the first thing that will be compressed because it is the uh, has the light, lowest pressure behind it is your inferior vena cava and um, if that is compressed then you're reducing the preload so the amount of blood that's getting to your heart, um, which means your heart has to work um, less hard because the um, pumping of the heart, the strength of the heart pumping is proportional to the preload. And that's um, Starling's law, I believe. Um, though do correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and that just basically means your blood pressure will be lower. And again, that can cause a bigger drop from lying standing blood pressures. Um, finally, the effect of changes in posture on arterial blood pressure and VQ matching in the lung. So um, VQ matching is the um, body's ability to um, match ventilation and perfusion so if you've got a bit of dead space in your lung so you've got something um blocking an uh one of your blood supplies um one of your blood supply branches like a pulmonary embolism um your um body isn't able to match ventilation however it is able to match perfusion to ventilation. So if you're, um, if you've accidentally aspirated some something and it's blocking off a big bronchial, your body will be able to reduce the amount of blood going to that part of the lung, and um, that maintains the saturations in your blood, um, and yeah. So that, that's VQ matching. Um, I don't know if I explained that very well. If you have any questions, please ask, just shout out. Um, and what happens when you stand is we've already spoken about blood pooling in different areas. If you think about the blood in just your lungs, it's going to start pooling at the base of your lungs. So your body's going to have to account for 
where the blood is pooling and where the oxygen is, where the air is. So the VQ matching machinery will be used differently when you're lying and standing. I don't know if that makes sense. Please shout out. Um, I feel like um, I'm talking in circles, but I, yeah, that is my best way of explaining. So that's it pretty much for, um, for orthostatic challenge that I have for you. I think it'd be good to do some, um, some MCQ questions. So just checking um, on the extension syllabus, um, where do the afferent signals from the carotid sinus pass along? Which nerve? Yeah, so the glossopharyngeal nerve. So the vagus is um, the other way. Um, vagus is giving you the efferent signals, so the signals from your brain that um, affect, that cause the effects in your lungs, heart. Um, yep, yeah, fine. So afferent signals from the carotid sinus pass to you. Guys are quick. Yep, perfect. I didn't even say that, so picked up well. Efferent signals are transmitted to the heart via OK, so um, it's both cardiac, sympathetic and vagus nerves because the symp sympathetic nervous system is upregulating and you have a um, simultaneous um, downregulation of the parasympathetic pathways. Um, so both um, pathways are working for the same thing. Um, sympathetic nervous system is your colloquially fight or flight system. So that is going to excite your heart um, to increase blood pressure. Your parasympathetic is your colloquial rest and digest. That is going to dampen down your heart's um, ability to pump. So your heart rate will be lower, stroke volume will be lower. Um, and that in turn means your um, blood pressure is lower that's, we don't want that, so we're going to be dampening down. Okay. Efferent signals are transmitted to peripheral arterioles via, so this is a harder one. I'll show the answers just in interest of time. Yeah, well done. So here you're thinking about what makes, so what, what are you wanting in the peripheral arterioles? If you're trying to increase, increase your blood pressure, you want your arterioles to constrict, right? You're increasing the total peripheral resistance. And um, from that, you're thinking about what receptors are on arterioles and which ones cause vasoconstriction and as you all have uh, done well it's the um, noradrenergic nerves so well done okay um efferent ganglionic transmission is mainly via Okay, so um, the sympathetic nervous system um, at the preganglionic 
uh, nerves uses muscarinic receptors, right? At the periphery, so where a um, nerve meets the heart, um, in this instance, we're going for adrenaline or noradrenaline, sorry, um, but centrally the receptors are muscarinic, therefore it has to be acetylcholine. Does that make sense? This is going back to like neuro rather than physiology, so it's a bit of a mean question for this lecture, but um, in your MCQs you might get mixed questions like this. Hopefully it does, no one's shouting out, so I'm assuming yes. Okay, fine. If you have any questions, you can pop them in Socrative anonymously or shout out. Um, I won't. Well, while you're asking questions, um, I'm going to move on because otherwise we'll be here waiting for a long time. Um, and we'll come back to any questions if there are any. So exercise physiology. We'll try and spend a little longer on this, but I'm going to have to pick up the pace because I'm going quite slowly um, because you guys wanted to focus on exercise physiology. So metabolism and exercise um i'm gonna have to move on unfortunately but if you do have questions pop them in the chat box or shout out please so how can you classify exercise and just throw out a couple ideas again doesn't have to be long you don't have to get every single one just think about ways you can classify exercise OK, I'm going to show answers just because of time. Lovely. Got a couple in there. So voluntary. Yeah, really nice. Um, aerobic, anaerobic. Um, isometric, dynamic. Fine. So those are the ones I was going for. But the other people who um, answered other things like, yeah, um, that is exercise. But um, just thinking about classifying, you're thinking about how you can um, separate different types of exercise. Um, some people put like cardio, cardiovascular versus like weights and stuff. So that's fair enough as well. So fine. So um, the main ones that we're classifying for this purpose are aerobic and anaerobic, dynamic and static, type one and type two. And voluntary and involuntary, um, as someone said, um, are also good classifications, especially when you're talking about experiments. So if you've come across any experiments that use involuntary exercise um, to demonstrate how exercise is controlled and the physiological response to it. Those um, kinds of experiments are basically just um, assessing the response of the muscle without um, conscious input. And that is quite important as we will come to see, hopefully. So metabolism accounts for about 60% of heat production um, at rest. And while you're exercising, obviously you're me metabolizing a bit more. Um, you're using your muscles, um, you're using up your glucose reserves um, or your fat reserves, depending on the type, duration of exercise. Um, and that will generate more heat, which is kind of... Uh, hopefully is kind of logical. Um, a lot of people who do exercise ph physiology like measuring metabolic rate. Um, you can do this by measuring oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide production. And we'll look in a minute, in a minute at the res we'll look in a minute at the respiratory quotient. You can also measure heat because we've said that that's a representative of how much metabolic activity is going on and you can measure your um work output so like um i don't know if you guys ever did this at like a science um, museum or something um but they like have a bike and you ride it and like try and light up a bulb um that sort of thing you're measuring how much energy is being created um which is termed the work output the respiratory quotient um, is basically just this. The RQ is the volume of 
carbon dioxide divided by the volume of oxygen. So hypothetically, you could measure, measure this in a patient. You could put a bag around their face with air in, make them exercise for about five minutes, and then take the bag and try and measure how much carbon dioxide and oxygen is breathed in or out. Practicality of that might be questionable, um, but I'm pretty sure that is done in some experiments. Um, so there's that way. And you can also use um, this equation to measure fuels directly. So here I've got the equation for glucose. Um, so what we're basically doing is we're just taking 6O2 and 6CO2. If we do 6CO2 divided by 6O2, so 6 divided by 6, it's 1. So the respiratory quotient for um, glucose as a fuel is 1. Different um, fuels will have different quotients. I believe fats tend to be... Um, I believe it's a higher quotient, but um, definitely um, make sure that that is the case. Um, and that means that the fuel is more efficient at producing energy um, during steady state exercise. So what happens during exercise? I think this is another Socrative question. What happens to your body? You can be general or medical, I don't mind. Okay, so I'll show the answers. Increased use of glucose and oxygen, heart rate and respirate increase. Yep, increased heart rate, lactic acid, well done, uh, sweating, respiratory rate, strict volume, blood pressure. Yep, um, cardiac output, respirate, metabolic demand. Yep, that's really good. Nice little factoid there. Um, reduced venous saturation. Lovely. Um, we'll come to that in a second. Um, yeah, lovely. Okay, you've all hit the nail on the head. Well done. Um, so I like splitting this up into body systems because it just helps with my thinking. I'm a very basic thinker. So in your musculoskeletal system, um, in your type 1 fibres, you have your slow twitch type 1 fibres. Um, which are normally for endurance, um, exercise, or often used in posture. And your type 2 muscle fibres, um, or the fast twitch ones, which are good for like sprinting, um, but they fatigue quickly. So those two use different um, fuels. Type 1s tend to, tend to use fat-based fuels. Type 2 um, is more glucose-based, and that kind of matches if you think about the biochemistry, um, even though I know it's painful to do. Um, it matches what you would expect. So type 1, you're getting much more energy from a single molecule through the TCA cycle. Type 2 with the glucose, probably anaerobic respiration, and um, you can only use the pyruvate um, system, and that produces much less energy, much less ATP. Um, respiratory system, you're having a increase in your breathing rate. The breathing reason for that is because you need to meet your oxygen demand. You are now using oxygen, more oxygen than you were before um, in your TCA cycle to um, aerobically respire. Um, and you are also producing much more carbon dioxide. Um, so your breathing rate needs to increase to take in more oxygen and get rid of all the carbon dioxide you're creating. Um, cardiovascular, you need to increase your cardiac output, and the reason for that is to um, get more blood quicker to the places that need this high oxygen demand and need um, metabolic um, products to be taken away. 
And the way that this is done is by increasing heart rate and stroke volume. And as we know that that in turn increases blood pressure and um, directly increases cardiac output. Um, and your um, arterioles will vasoconstrict um, to divert, so sorry, your AV shunts will um, constrict to divert blood um, away from muscles that aren't being used and towards muscles that are being used. Oh, and you also have thermoregulation on there. So um, as people said on the answers, um, you sweat because you want to get rid of all that, that excess heat that we've already talked about you're getting um, with the increased metabolic drive. So just a bit of a deeper dive. Um, your respiratory changes are um, a bit more complicated than just getting rid of carbon dioxide and getting more oxygen um, because the you, you might have thought this when I was saying um, it, your arterial blood is already fully saturated. So for normal people, your saturations will be 96 to 98 percent. Some people might have 100. So you can't really get much more oxygen into your blood. Um, however, you somehow have to um, get more oxygen to your muscle. Um, and that is part of the challenge that you're facing with exercise. Um, yeah, so um, what you're trying to do is take in as much oxygen to completely um, saturate your venous blood during the oxygenation um, to try and meet the demand as much as possible. So your if your arterial blood is normally fully saturated, you want to keep that full saturation up to par. Your venous blood will be less saturated than normal. So venous blood saturations could be around 70 maybe in a normal person. If you're exercising, they might, might drop lower. Um, and your part of your challenge is trying to get the, let's say, um, I don't know, 50% in your venous back to the 98% that it should be. Um, we've already said that the heart rate and stroke volume are increasing in the heart, so the blood is passing through quicker and you have to create enough of a uh, diffusion gradient for the oxygen to um, diffuse into the blood. Um, and yeah, I've got here 0.2 seconds. Um, so that's the challenge. That's why you have to breathe fast. Um, I think that's everything that's on there. So this is um, a graph of your ventilation with exercise. So when you start exercising, sometimes even if you think about exercising, your ventilation will have a sharp increase. It will um, continue to have a more gradual increase and then it will plateau. So there's these three phases, one, two, three, um, during steady exercise, as soon as you stop exercising, your ventilation will come down, but it won't be all the way back to your baseline because you're trying to um, meet your lactate um, oxygen debt um, and trying to just get back to your normal physiology. Um, and you have to do that over a little bit of time. Um, so this is a useful diagram, very badly drawn by me, but I'm sure you guys could draw a better one um, for your notes or you could just steal mine, that's fine. Um, so these phases um, obviously have underlying physiology, they don't just happen. Um, so how the mechanism by which the, there's this fast response in phase one is through feed forward control. Um, and this feed forward control um, is basically centrally mediated. So when I said that even thinking about exercise can cause your ventilation to increase, this is the reason why, it's because it is a centrally mediated system. So there's a few different theories on how the brain mediates this increase in ventilation. 
the F of copy theory I quite like. It's basically saying that the um, areas in your brain that are generating exercise have um, nerves that go from the same areas and are activated by the same um, you know, thought process to in engage in exercise. Um, and those um, other nerves that are like in parallel with the motor nerves will go to the medullary respiratory centers um, and cause that increase in ventilation. There's some evidence that um, the central mediation is a learned response. And um, that I believe was done in um, goats or sheep that had artificial dead space. So part of their lung was basically made not um, viable to work. And um, they were able to adjust their breathing um, to account for the part of the lung that wasn't working anymore. I hope that makes sense. You also have some feedback control. And this is what um, comes more into play with um, the later phases. So um, you can you have your peripheral chemoreceptors um, are the main things, and we're um, I'll come to that in a second because it's a bit complicated. Um, you have uh, mechanoreceptors in your muscles, and they'll detect stretch. So if you're um, running, your muscles will be able to tell that they are being stretched and contracted, and that can um, that will have some feedback control in the respiratory centers in the brain. You also have metaboreceptors. So they'll um, detect the local um, metabolites that are made during um, respiration, during exercise. So ADP is a product of ATP when it's um, hydrolyzed. Um, potassium, protons, protons from the um, electron transport chain, um, potassium um, will come out of cells because of um, the need to balance the electrochemical gradient. So as you get more protons in the cytoplasm, you'll have you'll um, have a pumping out of potassium um, to keep the charge inside a cell neutral. So the peripheral chemoreceptors are found in the carotid bodies. I think there's also some in the aortic arch, but many refer to the carotid body ones. Um, I said they play a role in phase two in particular, so this kind of slower upstrip. Um, normally, conventionally, they uh, respond to carbon dioxide levels, but we've already said that um, the arterial supply, supply um, has normal saturation of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So the levels of oxygen and carbon dioxide in your arterial supply won't change between um, exercise and rest. What changes is your venous um, levels. So your venous levels of oxygen will be much lower than normal, so at rest, and um, the carbon dioxide levels will be much higher in your venous circulation than at rest. So um, there is a big debate about which um, um, factor is causing the chemoreceptors to respond because we've said it's not carbon dioxide um, and loads have been proposed. You can look up um, the debate between Westman and Patterson um, and factor X is just what's like the term for whatever it is that um, activates the carotid bodies. If you'd like me to go into more detail on that, I can, if we have time, um, just let me know. So this is another little diagram um, just to show um, what happens at the chemoreceptors. So um, this is conventional. This is what normally happens. You normally have an uh, increase in carbon dioxide detected by chemoreceptors. Um, you'll then increase your respiratory rates to blow off that carbon dioxide um, and reduce the uh, levels of carbon dioxide, which is um, effect effectively acts as an acid in the blood. Um, 
so yeah that that's what would normally happen in physiology so if you were like retaining carbon dioxide because you had copd um this is what might be happening um however i've put this note here in exercise the arterial level of carbon dioxide stays the same so you don't get this same feedback loop loop it's not due to carbon dioxide levels it's due to something else that factor x fine so cardiovascular changes chemoreceptors again will drive cardiovascular function um, so alongside the ventilation we've already spoken about the blood pressure with baroreceptors um, so because your blood pressure is increasing during exercise your baroreceptors will work to stop that increase too much um, so it will keep the heart rate in check basically um, and you'll also have an element of um, your um, peripheral um, vasodilation because if we remember blood pressure is a function of heart uh, cardiac output and total peripheral resistance so you can change the total peripheral resistance to avoid having high blood pressure but again that is um, in response to the baroreceptor response um, uh, yeah so that's the vasodilation so yeah you also have the response to metabolites um, and that is to increase flow to the muscles that are producing these metabolites so undergoing exercise um, yeah okay fine so extension syllabus stuff um, they mention mechanical efficiency so um, this is talking about how um, yeah how, how much power you can produce um, as like how much power you can produce based on how much um, power you've been given so how much um, so how much energy I'm creating by running versus how much energy I've been given in my like food and stuff or how much um, I've trained to um, be a good runner um, so if you go running off and you will be more efficient than someone who doesn't run at all I hope that makes sense um, ECG testing so you can test for exercise intolerance using an ECG um, and um, that like, basically like we said before the um, cardiovascular system is limited by the baroreceptors um, so um, if you have exercise intolerance you might just not be able to either reach a heart rate that's um, sufficient for your um, workload or um, you might not be able to um, you might be over your body system might be over but basically you could either be going way too fast with your heart or way too slow and um, that might be because your um, heart is being dampened down too much or being upregulated too much um, you could also use this for research I put a question mark there because I'm not really sure of many things that have but hypothetically you could and that might be something you want to reference in an essay um, if you have one um, on this topic um, for so the fact is limiting exercise in normal subjects and in patients with heart and or lung disease so for a healthy individual the limit of the amount of exercise you can do aside from like just um your so if, if you were able to do as much exercise as you possibly possibly were in terms of like psychological um limitations your limit will be the oxygen delivery to muscles so you know when you get cramp in your leg when you've exercised too much that's your lactate buildup. your lactate is um basically a proxy for your oxygen debt in your muscles if your oxygen delivery isn't able to meet um, the requirements of the muscles, that is what's going to limit you. However, in disease, the limit is more your heart or lung function. So if you're, um, it, it's kind of like a secondary or the cause of a limit to oxygen delivery. So um, if your heart isn't working very well and you can't meet, meet the demand for a blood pressure, um, to perfuse your 
muscles sufficiently, then that is going to be the limitation. Um, again, hopefully that makes sense. Um, so given that in healthy individuals, oxygen delivery is the limitation, many people try to uh, overcome that limitation um, by increasing their oxygen delivery. So you might have heard pe about people um, using um, like artificial or injected EPO, but you can actually um, produce that naturally through altitude training and many athletes do this. And we might touch on it quickly with the high altitude section. Um, there is, so if we go back to the learned response that I mentioned earlier, we could hypothetically learn to improve lung function. Um, yeah, that's kind of self-explanatory and um, we can increase our heart size. Um, that can be a bit disadvantageous. Eventually you hear about sudden death in cyclists often because they had this cardiac hypertrophy and it puts a lot of strain on the heart. Um, um, yeah. Um, so not always a good thing, but it is something that you can do to increase oxygen delivery to your muscles. Okay, we'll have to really zoom through these questions. I am taking way longer than I was expecting on this. So the most likely factor to cause dilation of blood vessels in active muscles is an increase in. And we're back on Socrative, by the way. I'm aiming for five now. Yep. So local metabolites we're looking at, um, the sympathetic marginergic activity um, is kind of, a, it, it, if, if you think about what's happening um, at your muscle, you're exercising, you're producing these like lactate, ADP, um, that's going to be a much quicker response because you're not having to go through the whole nervous system. So you're not going to have to have the feedback loop of an afferent pathway, the brain, an efferent pathway, an effector. Um, the local metabolites act on local receptors in the vessels to cause vasodilation. So and that can happen without any um, nervous innovation. So that will be a bit quicker. Heart rate is increased primarily as a result of an increase in Yep, yeah, well done. Move on. Stroke volume is increased primarily as a result of an increase in. Oh, I showed it way too quick. Sorry, guys. Um, but yeah, it seems like everyone understood that. Um, the distribution of cardiac output toward working muscle is primarily medi mediated by. Okay, <laughs> um, I think the important thing here was the adrenergic effects. Um, what you are thinking about is um, what receptors are present in the heart, basically. Um, and uh, beta receptors are probably what comes to mind more because um, the... Um, yeah, so <laughs> beta receptors are what comes to mind more um, because like there's beta blockers and stuff. Also, if you think about um, what alpha receptors do, they are normally, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think they're normally inhibitory. Um, and I, yeah, I might be wrong about that, but, but I think there's an acronym KISS, um, alpha 1, alpha 2, beta 1, beta 2. It's been a while since I've done this, but um, it basically alpha receptors will be inhibitory so it's not going to increase cardiac output towards working mus muscle whereas beta receptors are stimulatory so qs coupled receptors um hopefully that makes sense to you guys and i'm not completely uh, misconstruing or conflating things right next one um plasma levels of adrenaline are increased primarily as a result of an increase in
Yep, lovely. Arterial CO2 partial pressure. This is a key concept. Beautiful. I'm very happy that that's like a big thing for this. The change in ventilation during exercise is thought mainly to be due to. bit slower on this one. OK, so um, this is basically just going back to the previous question. Um, carbon dioxide levels in arterial um, circulation won't change, neither will the oxygen levels, so it's just none of the above. That um, was just, again, proof of concept worded a bit differently. But if you saw this question uh, in, your M in your MCQ, you might be like, oh, this is horrible. But you just need to think about that concept that um, the blood gases don't change in your arterial circulation during exercise. It's your venous gases that do. OK. Metabolic rate in watts can be estimated from oxygen consumption if we know that. This is not a very nice question, so I understand why people are being a bit slow. OK, so um, I think for this one, if you were to approach this in your exam, you have to think about what the units for watts are. Um, and what information you've been given, what more information you need. So you've been told about oxygen consumption. Um, so you'll want something that's relevant to the oxygen consumption. Um, so I would zoom in on C and E. E um, probably isn't very useful to work out metabolic rate in watts because watts is, um, oh, actually, I, th I think it's joules per, I think it's just joules, actually. So we, we want a unit of power, um, and this is the answer that has joules. Um, so, yeah, again, a bit of a nasty question, but... It is logical. If you um, had it, you would be able to do it. So don't worry. OK, if there are any questions, do type them quickly. But I am going to move on swiftly because I am being very slow. Um, so at high altitude, we said we're not too worried about this. So I will zoom through and we'll just move straight on to the MCQs. I might have to run over, unfortunately. Um, so your response to um, altitudes uh, is basically this acclimatization response. Sorry. Um, acclimatization is defined as an increased sensitivity to both hypoxia, so low oxygen and CO2, um, uh, so low CO2 as well. So hypoxia and hypocapnia. Um, sorry. Defined as an increased sensitivity to both hypoxia and CO2. That's hypercapnia, I'm being silly there. Um, in altitude, you will have lower gases of both, but um, the response will be in uh, to hypercapnia. So we're thinking about chemoreceptors again, basically. Your chemoreceptors will normally respond to low oxygen, high carbon dioxide. That normal response is just amplified in acclimatization. So again, we have another response graph, um, another three phases. Um, the first response, phase one, is within seconds, and um, you will have a big increase in your ventilation. Over 30 minutes to an hour, you will get a decrease, and we'll discuss why soon. And after a while, um, this is a break in the axis. It doesn't look like it, but it is. Um, after eight hours or more, you get this um, increase in your ventilation again. So phase three. Um, this is an extension syllabus, but it's a good um, way to just demonstrate um, what acclimatization is. Um, so this sensitization to oxygen and carbon dioxide um, changes. So um, when you have a lower level of oxygen, so this line we're looking at, um, 
a small change in carbon dioxide will cause a massive change. So if you drew a triangle here, it will cause a massive change in um, ventilation. And that's basically what climatization is. This graph um, and the pushing of the line, so this is normal out into this kind of fan shape is just known as the Oxford fan. Um, so there are a few different um, concepts and um, concepts theories for why acclimatization happens. Um, often people cite renal compensation, um, but I have put a kind of vague question mark there because it might not necessarily be the case. So um, when you're um, responding to the low levels of oxygen, um, your response will be hyperventilation. You want to get in more oxygen. Um, and you are also have low um, carbon dioxide levels. And like I said before, carbon dioxide tends to act as a... Um, OK, so ignore what I said. Sorry, guys, I've, I've been talking for too long. Um, ignore what I said about um, oxygen. Um, carbon dioxide acts as a prop uh, as an acid in the blood. So less carbon dioxide, which is what is the case in altitude, um, the partial pressures of all gases is lower. Um, less carbon dioxide will mean that your um, blood becomes alkalotic um, because there's less acid. Um, so the um, OK, <laughs> I'm very sorry about this. I'm getting myself confused. So in response to respiratory alkalosis due to hyperventilation, you're hyperventilating um, because you've got low oxygen. So I was right in the first place. You do have low oxygen, you're hyperventilating um, and you have a respiratory alkalosis. Your body responds by increasing bicarbonate excretion to get rid of some of the alkaline um, components you have in your body and to try and um, bring plasma and carbon um, plasma and um, cerebrospinal fluid bicarbonate levels down um, so in turn making them both more acidic um, the mechanism behind this is a type a b intercalated cell switch state uh, you can search that up i'm not going to go too much into it because i don't like the kidney very much um, but it basically means that you have more hydrogen ions available in the body to counter the alkalosis. And this whole thing is dependent on carbon dioxide levels. Um, maintaining carbon dioxide or inducing hypoxia still causes this fan to open, which is why people are not too keen on, the, well, some people are not too keen on the renal compensation. Um, so it's actually something that's intrinsic and unique to hypoxia. So the hypoxia itself is what's causing the acclimatization, not carbon dioxide, as would be the uh, mechanism with renal compensation. Um, you have a hypoxic ventilatory decline. So looking back at this um, uh, fan with the hypoxic ventilatory decline, you're going to be pushing your um, line down and to the right. Um, this is a gradual decrease in the sensitivity of chemoreceptors to the hypoxia. Um, and it's been found in experiments that this is because of a reduce of the maximum calcium influx in the chemoreceptors. Um, this is something that only happens with the hypoxia. And um, over time, this causes the fan to open, which means um, even really large levels of carbon dioxide. So going from 40 to 45, won't bring that much of a change in ventilation. Um, hopefully you guys can see that and that makes sense. So um, the debate is between Weston and Robbins. This is um, Robbins' idea that it's an intrinsic change in the calcium influx in chemoreceptors. West is the renal compensation. The likelihood is it's a bit of a mix of these two mechanisms. Um, yeah. So aside from acclimatization, you also have adaptation. We've already mentioned EPO. You can also have polycythemia, which is just increased red blood cells, um, and you can affect 
accept your bore shift. So I'm sure you all recognize this. Um, if you increase your um, level of 2, 3 DPG, you can shift the curve to the right um, and have more effective oxygen delivery to your um, tissues. Maladaptive changes um, include the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, um, which you've um, kind of spoken about with the VQ matching. Normally, um, if you have a small area of hypoxia that's been blocked off from something in the bronchioles, if you aspirate it or something, um, it's a good thing. But if you have hypoxia throughout your lung, then it's a bad thing because um, the response would be to reduce perfusion to the whole lung, which is obviously not going to be great. Um, your blood isn't going to be getting any oxygen. Um, fine. Um, you can also get what's called um, high altitude pulmonary edema um, and combined with right heart failure um, from right heart strain because of the increased pressure in the lungs. Um, so that vasoconstriction in the lungs from the VQ matching um, is called Mongi's disease and that's seen in Andean populations and they're a example of a maladaptive group of people. Um, you also have high altitude cerebral edema um, through a similar mechanism to the um, pulmonary edema and acute mountain sickness um, it is caused when oxygen cannot be delivered even at rest and you get a lot of horrible symptoms um, and you can get progression to pulmonary or cerebral edema. When you get people going up um, Everest they need to take medications with them um, to avoid these things and these are the medications um, and you guys can look through this in your own time um, because I, we're already running over. Um, just briefly, the Sherpa people are an example of well-adapted um, people. They have some kind of counterintuitive ad adaptations, um, including um, so I haven't really put the counterintuitive ones, but that's fine. Um, they basically don't experience HPV, so the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, that VQ matching. Um, they have higher lung capacities, um, better lung physiology, um, and they have more nitric oxide, which is a vasodilator, um, perhaps linking to that HPV. And they also have more capillaries um, to increase uh, oxygen provision to muscle. Um, uh, th this is the, the um, counterintuitive bit. So they actually have lower hemoglobin and fewer mitochondria. Um, so that, yeah, that might be surprising. Um, but instead they use glucose, which is the anaerobic fuel um, and phosphocreatinine also is anaerobic. Um, and a bit about their genetic changes. Chain Stokes breathing is a um, type of breathing that um, normally happens in people close to the end of life, um, but can also happen at high altitude. And it's this kind of um, slowish, like, yeah, quite slow breathing, followed by a short burst of very quick, big breaths. Um, do look it up. That uh, article is a decent summary. Um, we'll go back to Socrative. Again, very quick. Ah, there's a question. Can you explain why the answer to the C not be okay? Um, so I think it's just that, um, let's just try and find the question again. So I, I'm pretty sure it's just that um, one of them didn't have, I've gone past it, didn't have the oxygen dependence in the answer. So um, yeah. Um, so C is 20 kilojoules per litre of oxygen. Um, B is um, the energy content of body fuel is 20 kilojoules per gram. If in the question stem they said estimated from um, the amount you've eaten, B would be the answer. Does that make sense? I hope it does. If not, 
uh, let me know. Um, OK, we skip these. So uh, actually, we're just going to skip that. That is not very useful. Acclimatization is defined as. So an increased sensitivity to both hypoxia and carbon dioxide. Um, it's an increased sensitivity. So, um, yeah, it it's an increased sensitivity. Um, your your chemoreceptors are more responsive to changes in hypoxia or to cha to changes in carbon dioxide when in conditions of hypoxia. Um, fine. Pop in any questions if there are any, we will try and zoom through. So body temperature, I know you guys wanted to focus on this. Um, we will try. So I, I'm not going to go through the socative. Um, normal body temperature is normally 36 to 38 degrees, um, 38.7. Um, your normal cycle is, um, your normal body temperature is dependent on your circadian rhythms. And it's normally highest in the evening, lowest in the early morning. Um, yeah, so that's a good graph of it. Um, it just fluctuates between, but it's always within this normal range. And um, in the menstrual cycle, it's also ch changed by um, ovulation. So it's highest following and during ovulation. Um, as you can see through this, um, again, it's staying within that normal range. Um, so there can be fluctuations, but it's always between the normal range. If um, someone was too low in their temp temperature, you'd be worried about like shock, too high, they've got a fever, worried about infection, that sort of thing. Um, so it's always pathological. Ne um, so your core te temperature um, needs to be at a certain level to um, allow your chemical reactions, your enzymes to work at optimum temperatures. Um, and there's a certain level of uh, reaction speed that's necessary for life. Um, however, as you will probably remember from like A-level biology, if you did it, um, denaturing proteins can happen um, above a certain temperature. So if your, your, your um, body works at a specific temperature and that is what it's meant to be kept at basically. Um, and this is just an interesting thing, um, one degree temperature drop can decrease your efficiency by 13%. Um, so to body temperature, again, um, just trying to chunk it. So heat loss, um, you have radiation, evaporation, convection, conduction. That is in descending order of how much heat you lose. So the most heat you lose is through radiation. Um, evaporation is increased by sweating. Convection is um, how much um, the air takes away the heat. So like if you're in a windy um, valley, you might get colder quicker because of the wind. Conduction is how much heat you lose by touching a solid object. Um, so if you put your hands um, in the fridge, you might be cold, but that's the least amount of heat. Radiation is just losing heat to the um, surrounding space. Um, so like no wind. You, could, you can also um, increase your radiation with vasodilating. Um, so bringing your blood, your hot blood to the surface um, so that it can escape and radiate out quicker. In terms of retaining heat, um, you can shiver. Um, that so pilo erection is just when the um, hairs on your skin stand up. So um, when you get like chicken skin and you have AV shunts um, that direct blood away from the surface, mediated by alpha 1 and 2 adrenergic receptors. Um, and you also have some basic constriction. Um, and you can also have behavioral um, input. So, you know, if you're too hot, you're going to... Um, take off your jumper, take off layers of clothes. Um, you might move to a more shady area if you're in the sun. And if you're um, too cold, you'll put on more layers, um, pop the heating on, that sort of thing, have a hot drink. So behavioral um, ones are also important. 
Um, thermogenesis, so um, the only the way that we normally would uh, produce heat, don't forget that we have normal metabolism, so we do generate heat through normal metabolism, but there are some um, ways to dedicate um, production of heat um, or dedicate your body to producing heat rather than having it as like a side effect of um, metabolism and just general energy loss. Um, brown adipose, adipose tissue um, is normally or traditionally known to be abundant in newborns um, and that's because babies can't shiver but it is still present um, in adults. Um, the brown adipose tissue is rich in mitochondria and uncoupling protein one and that uncoupling protein one is what um, causes the heat to be generated. Um, it Instead of um, having um, ATP created, it just causes this dissipation um, when you get the protons in the electron transport chain crossing the inner mitochondrial membrane. Um, yeah, so a decrease in temperature um, will cause um, a sympathetic nervous system action um, and you'll get transcription factors that um, increase mitochondrial proliferation and fatty acid metabolism. Um, a fatty acid metabolism, remember, is TCA, then electron transport chain. Um, the 2,4-dinitrophenol diet pill um, is an exogenous uncoupling protein, so it is very effective at making you lose uh, weight because you use up your fuel res reserves um, and use it as heat, but it is highly toxic and potentially fatal, so definitely not advisable to go for. Um, control centres for body temperature um, are um, hypothalamic, um, so your anterior hypothalamus um, is for cooling and it acts by parasympathetic system, posterior is for heating, sympathetic system, so again we're thinking fight or flight, rest and digest, rest and digest you don't need to be like hot and um, uh, producing as much energy as you can. Um, and yeah, vice versa for sympathetic um, receptors, um, your TRP channels will detect um, changes in heat. Um, it's, um, yeah, and they're just in your periphery, so like in your skin. Um, you also have central endogenous warm sensitive neurons, um, and those are more for like core temperature detection. Um, Thermoneutral zone is just referring to the um, like ambient temperature in a room that um, you will be most comfortable at. Um, so you'll be best at controlling your body temperature. Um, so if you're wearing clothes, um, like just normal levels of clothes, like a t-shirt and trousers, 18 to 22 degrees. Um, and if you're not wearing clothes, that will obviously go up because your clothes do act as a good um, insulator. Um, with temperature dysregulation, hypothermia, um, you are, if you go below 35 degrees, that's hypothermia, um, you can get loss of consciousness around 30 degrees. With the hypothermia, you become bradycardic, so your heart rate slows down, and you go into ventricular fibrillation, which is like, um, yeah, one of the really bad rhythms you can have in your heart at about 28 degrees. Um, you can also get frostbite um, if you get like, if you stand in the snow with no shoes on um, for a while um, and you get hypothermia in, a, in an extremity, you can um, get frost, frostbite and that can pr progress to gangrene. Um, hyperthermia is a core temperature above 38 degrees, 38.3 degrees, sorry. Um, that can happen with burns, heat exhaustion, um, so you've been sweating way too much and you lost loads of fluid. Um, you can get heat stroke, which again is similar to heat exhaustion, but worse. Um, if you go over 40.6 degrees as your core temperature, um, your thermoregulation stops working. And that's something that's quite characteristic of people who are um, too hypothermic. They will be um, taking off sorry, no, hyper, in hypothermia, 
Um, actually, let's not worry about that. <laughs> um, fever um, can cause hyperthermia because you have this uh, internal increase in temperature. And if you're not able to get rid of that heat, then um, you can get hyperthermic. Um, antipyretics are um, the drugs that are used to reduce um, temperature. Um, this extension syllab syllabus, um, I've never used Kleber's rule for anything, um, but it is this, um, the rate of heat production scales um, with mass. Um, you can have thero therapeutic hypothermia, so um, it can be used to reduce ischemic damage in the brain, um, reduce hair loss in chemo, um, it's used in neurosurgery and heart surgery to um, reduce ischemic injury during um, times when they need like to get in somewhere that um, has perfusion, um, high levels of perfusion or highly reliant on perfusion. Malignant hypothermia um, is normally related to adverse drug reactions, um, sexamethonium and halothane. So halothane's a, um, uh, um, what's it called? Um, they use it in uh, surgeries to put you to sleep. I just can't remember the name of the thing. It's a very simple thing. Um, and you get um, uncontrolled calcium release from the sarcoplasmic retic reticulum. Um, ATP hydrolysis increases um, and it's treated with dantrolene, um, which blocks the um, ryanidine receptors. Um, basically stopping the uncontrolled calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay, let's zoom through these last questions. I'm really sorry that I've run over so much. Um, won't do that, won't do that. So heat exhaustion causes... OK, um, this is a difficult one. Hopefully you've all got an explanation when you answered. Um, so heat exhaustion causes dehydration and hypovolemia. Aldosterone, um, which is like part of your um, angiotensin um, pathway for like blood pressure regulation, um, aldosterone acts to retain sodium and therefore water and it excretes potassium. So um, in response to the low fluid level, so hypovolemia, and therefore low blood pressure, you get aldosterone release. I hope that makes sense. Uh, sunburn causes. Yeah, thermal in injury. Um, raised plasma potassium, that is fair enough. If you get cell damage, you do get increased plasma potassium, but um, it's the simplest answer is the best answer if there is a simple answer. So um, thermal injury is what we're going for. Heat syncope causes, so fainting due to heat. Okay, uh, let's look at the explanation. So heat syncope is basically fainting when it's too hot, normally due to vasovagal response to a loss of fluids in the body. Um, so that's the hypovolemia again. So vasovagal response is often what you would associate with syncope episodes. It's um, activation of the vagus nerve and subsequent response via the vagus nerve. Um, the vagal activity will downregulate afferent discharge in the carotid. So Vagus is parasympathetic. Activating the vagus will increase um, your like rest and digest system. Um, and yeah, you'll get a decreased rate of afferent discharge and carotid sinus. Hopefully that makes sense. Topical pilocarpine increases.
so yeah, <laughs> um, glandular secretion. Um, I know it's difficult with apocrine and eccrine. Um, so pilocarpine is a drug that acts as a muscarinic receptor agonist, and the eccrine sweat glands are innervated by cholinergic fibers. So they're the ones that are activated by pilocarpine. The apocrine sweat glands are activated in response to adrenaline. Um, so you can maybe remember apocrine, adrenaline, um, and then eccrine is the other one. Um, or maybe because it's got two Cs, it's cholinergic. I don't know how you want to do it, but that might be a way. Um, basal dermal blood flow. Um, I'm, I'm sure there is reasoning behind it. Um, I don't think I can try and explain it away at the moment. But um, if you do want me to, do send an email and I'll do my best. Um, in a temperature, in, sorry, in a temperate climate under normal conditions, the greatest loss of body heat occurs through. Yeah, well done. <laughs> 